Hi, everybody. This is Joseph Vogley of Stokely Films. I'm the co-writer, the director, and the creator of the new slasher sensation, Specimen 6, which will be out on DVD. Uh, by the time you see this, it will already be on digital and then DVD in a few weeks after that. All right, everybody. So uh, we got a really great, really special episode today here of No Country for Joe and Mariana. Uh, we're joined here today by Tony Maziello of the great SOV horror fame. Yes. And, um, and we got a great special today. Mariana, what are we talking about today? Well, Tony graciously joined us again uh, by my request to talk about uh, Metal Noir because I picked it up after we had our interview and I watched it once and then twice and then three times. Mm -hmm. And I really, really loved it. And I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to talk to Tony and I wanted to talk his ear off about it. <laughs> great, so this is our Metal Noir special episode where we just kind of geek out and we have a great film conversation about a really, really super cool uh, shot on video horror movie. Um, so uh, to start out, um, maybe we could re recap. Tony, what was the whole experience, your experience? I know it's uh, in well-documented form, but your experience of discovering this movie and how you put it out into the world. Yeah, so uh, back around, I'd say, 2011 or 12, um, I, I had been working on this uh, project called SOV The True Independence, which is a documentary slash web series. And uh, I've been working on that kind of covers the history of shot on video horror films. And I was uh, uh, interviewing a director, Jay Wolfel. Uh, he's best known for directing the movie Things, uh, Beyond Dreams Door, Demonica's Demon Gladiator from Hell. Uh, really nice guy. And we're hanging out, talking, chatting. And, uh, you know, we got to talk about VHS somehow. And I mentioned, you know, I'm a big fan, obviously, as you can see behind me. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, he had some tapes and he, he had some tapes uh, that, that uh, he was like, oh, I got these tapes, you know, I don't really need them anymore if, if you maybe want some of these tapes. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll take them. <laughs> and uh, one of the tapes was a dub tape. And I noticed on the tape, it, it said Dead Silence, which I recognized immediately because that was Hugh Gallagher's first movie. And I'm a huge Hugh Gallagher fan uh, for people not familiar with his work. He's best known for doing the Gore trilogy. So uh, Goregasm, Gorotica, Gore Horror. And Dead Silence was his first movie. And at the time, that was extremely hard to find. Like, I had never come across a copy in my uh, travels. And uh, so I was like, yes, I'm going to watch Dead Silence. And so I throw on Dead Silence. And on this same tape, there was a movie before it called Metal Noir. And I'm like, well, what is this Metal Noir thing? And immediately, I see it shot on video. I see, uh, you know, right when the credits start, I see the names Hugh Gallagher and Charles Pinion who are both, you know, SOV directors in their own right, you know, great directors. And I was like, wow, what is this movie? And I watched this movie, which was pretty much a dub of a dub of a dub. It, it, I mean, it had the rolling picture, you know, the whole, the whole really bad bootleg style quality to it. Uh, almost unwatchable, you know, honestly, but I grew up watching antenna TV, so it wasn't yeah. that big of a deal. And so, uh, you know, watched the movie and immediately fell in love with it and was like, hey, I'll do a review of this for my website. And I always like to do research and stuff like that on anything that I, I talk about. And so during my research, I pretty much, long story short, discovered the movie was never released. And so uh, I reached out to director David R. Williams, who I was able to get a hold of thanks to Hugh Gallagher and Charles Pinion, uh, put me in contact with him. And uh, yeah, the rest is kind of history. We, we uh, took the long road into uh, reconstructing and putting out Metal Noir. That's Awesome. So um, I have to say that this this is one of the cooler, like the thing that I love about this story is A, the way that it does look. So you reconstructed this film. Um, what, so I know you said that you had like from a couple different sources you had to take and then take those two things and put them back together in a way. How was the reconstruction process putting Metal Noir together? So, uh, yeah, um, like I mentioned, that, that copy that I had was, was pretty much terrible looking. And uh, David did have the master. He ma mailed me the master. But the, when I opened up the master, immediately I saw it was completely covered in mold. And uh, I tried to get it to some labs. All the labs were like, no, we're not touching this thing. <laughs> destroy our machines. So uh, there wasn't really much of an option. You know, it was like, well, do I just release my version? And so I went trying to find other copies of the movie and uh, 
thankfully Charles Pinion, he had had a VHS work print of the film. Um, but when I say work print, I mean work print. There was no music. There was, uh -huh. uh, you know, it was missing scenes. It didn't have everything in there. Some of it was alternate takes. And so, um, you know, I'm a purist. I wanted to put out the movie the way I saw it that first time, but in higher quality. And uh, so I went through the process of pretty much re-editing the movie using my print, the work print that I got from Charles, um, which also didn't look that great either. It was a digitized work print. He had thrown away the original tape. Uh -huh. So we were working with a digitized file. That's why there's some pixelization issues in some shots and scenes. And, um, but I was lucky enough to find the original soundtrack online, which was a godsend, uh, you know, um, because we could at least add those nice stereo music tracks back into the film. So it took, I'd say probably six to seven months of uh -huh. editing. You know, I, I literally tried to make it shot for shot. Like I, I wanted it to look exactly like the original. I mean, even the credits, you know, you can tell that they're obviously redone. I tried to line them up exactly how they were lined up in the original cut of the film. You know, it's very important to me. I'm, I'm kind of one of those purists, you know, I, I love, uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot of other companies, they re-release movies, especially SOV movies, and the directors go back and they re-edit them, they change them. And I think that's fine, but I also think, you know, a lot of us fans, we want the original. We want what was intended, the original intended release. So, you know, that's literally frame by frame. It was a very long wow. and arduous process. And at times, you know, there wasn't the footage. I mean, there, there is a few moments in the movie that I did have to take a few liberties with, not many. Uh, there's like the scene where Eric is uh, leaving Laurel's house. That one I had to kind of re-edit because the original footage, or the work print footage was very different than the original footage. And we just had to roll with that because it was way better quality. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, I mean, we, it's, it's shot for shot the same exact movie, so. I think on the second watch, you can definitely tell there's a lot of love and care being put into the film to put it back together and in the best shape it can. I like that visceralness though of the shot on video and how it, you can tell that it was lost and damaged in places in the here and there, but I think it kind of adds to the experience, especially the dirtiness of the story itself and the blood and the gore and the gristle. Um, Mariana, what are your thoughts now that you've seen the film several times? <laughs> um, same thing. Like, I really, I think that the, I mean, obviously higher quality gives you a different kind of like feeling to the movie. And I think actually the way that it was put together, Tony, you did like such an amazing job because it does add to that grit. Um, but it also, you can, you can tell that it was, that it, that it is separate um shots but you it kind of still flows you know in a in a way almost like like someone well obviously someone was holding a camera but like almost like someone was supposed to be there it was supposed to be someone just holding a camera taking in these events and i like joe said it really adds to that experience uh and i also as a creator and joe as a creator we often we'll share some small part of our work uh, with someone and immediately we'll get some kind of criticism back that obviously uh, is just their opinion or how they would like to see the movie but or or whatever it is that we're showing so i think it's a really awesome too that tony took the time to make it the vision that it was originally supposed to be um, because that's really difficult to do as as the as the outsider you know you want you're trying to stay so uh, objective to it um but you know there's so many people out there that want to make these changes and i agree that you know there are some there's some limitation to that but there's also some advantage to it i guess but yes i also want the original and i loved that you did that <laughs> You know, what's funny is actually, you know, it was shot by Hugh Gallagher, who also acted in the film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, his his uh, his statement after I, you know, sent him the print was, why didn't you fix the movie? Why didn't you cut out all the padding? Why didn't you, you know, he 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 thought, you know, and that's how it was back then. I mean, they, they were literally trying to pad these things out to, you know, 70, 75 minutes, because that was what was, you know, construed as a feature back then. 
you know, now you can make a feature that's 40 minutes and fans are fine with that as long as it's a good movie. Mm -hmm. But back then, you know, they did have to pad things out. And to him, you know, I should have cut out all the padding and whatnot. But uh, I explained to him, no, Hugh, you did a great job editing it the first time because he was the original editor as well. So mm -hmm. he was the original editor of the film as well. And, and, you know, I'd explain to him, no, Hugh, I, I loved what you did. We, we wanted to keep it, you know, that original way, you know. I like it. I think it breathes the movie out and you got to live with these characters. And um, that's the big thing about this. One. But before we, uh, I want to like, yeah, since we're here to talk metal and war, let's like kind of geek out and tell the story, mm -hmm. tell, you know, what the story is. Because for people new to this and are listening, maybe Mariana, do you want to like, kind of give us a synopsis of the story itself and then we can start going through it and just talking about our favorite crazy shit that's in the in the in the film we should we should do a series joe where it's just mariana doing bad synopses of movies mm -hmm. because i'm really bad at them you but can, hey, like go into italian or french if you need to to get the like the right <laughs> that's not the problem i just can't <laughs> form words you know, I'm a writer that doesn't know how to write sentences in your head. So, um, well, basically the movie is a woman buys this house. Uh, she completely ignores the fact that it's haunted. Uh, and she starts hearing this calling coming from the basement and something is down there. And uh, there's, there's a, uh, a, the, I guess the, is it, is it a ghost of, would you say it's a ghost of uh, Madly or like how would you like the souls like the trap the souls, souls of yeah they're they're busy uh trying to summon a dark god that uh that they they <laughs> it was funny to uh find that they were trying to do it for one reason and it backfires i don't want to give it away i don't know how much of it well, i think we're going into spoilers here a little bit because okay well basically madly wanted to use the dark god's powers for his own use uh that kind of backfires uh, so he, uh, he's, he becomes basically a slave of the dark God. And so is everyone else in this little town, which we get a little glimpse of. We don't really like get to see the whole town, uh, kind of like children of the corn, you know, you know, for sure the whole town is in on this cult. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in this one, it was really cool. The reveal of like, everyone already knows, uh, they're just bringing in more people um and yeah the, there's only one way to send the dark god back and he gets sent back but with uh there's there's quite the price there to be paid that was it that was my synopsis of it. <laughs> thank you good so, job buddy. i could have just read the back of the thing here <laughs> i guess um well i'll hand it over to tony tony uh, what is uh just Overall, what, what do you love about this film? You know, what is so great about this movie is not only is it shot just great. I mean, the, the, the camera work by Hugh Gallagher is great. The editing, I think, is really great. You know, uh, uh, one thing I always liked about Hugh's work, and I feel this movie really, it, it's funny that Hugh Gallagher and Charles Pinion are both in this movie because I feel this movie actually is very reminiscent of their work, but it's also 100% David Williams. Mm -hmm. And in, in that, what I mean is it's not just your average slice and dice type horror film. Mm -hmm. It has more, I would say, of an artistic type merit to it. You know, they were trying to be creative. They were trying to do a lot of, you know, artistic type, uh, you know, shots and uh, have uh, a little bit more of a subtext to the film not just, you know, like I said, your normal slice and dice. I mean, the whole movie is kind of has this dreamlike atmosphere. You don't know what's real, what's not real. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of very surreal in moments. You know, there's lots of uh, interesting religious imagery in the film. Um, you know, it is, it's definitely, it's just one of a kind, you know, it's, it's one of those movies. Like I said, you know, you can definitely see some Hugh Gallagher in there, uh, Charles Pinion as well as David Williams, but it's the sum of all those parts together that just makes this great, trippy, surreal, you know, horror film. While Bill Meyer did such an excellent job with the props, um, I was watching the commentary uh, version, and uh, when it comes to the scene where they're in the trailer and there's all those bones hanging everywhere, uh, I didn't know that those were like actual roadkill that 
Bill just like picked up off the road and just boiled at home. And that that's really awesome. And then also the giant cross where oh, the yeah. zombies are basically trying to eat her slash make love to her at the same time. You, I mean, the, the props in that are amazing. And William Meyer as the dark god was <laughs> just excellent. <laughs> Oh, he's so cool. I mean, he, he definitely lives up to his name, Wild Bill. He's a really nice guy. And, uh, you know, he told me a funny story about them uh, taking that cross up to the hill to go do that crucifixion scene and how, you know, a ton of people were kind of like, freaked out by them and because uh, everyone's dressed <laughs> as zombies and they're carrying the cross, you know. Uh. <laughs> but uh, he, he's done a lot of stuff. I believe he's done effects on some other films. Uh, and he's also d does a lot of acting. He's still acting which is really cool. Cool. He's like kind of my favorite part of the film because when he shows up, he's this huge imposing. Is he actually that big in real life? He's a he big looks, dude, yeah. He looks yeah, like he a looks, big dude, yeah. He fills the screen. <laughs> like super heavy metal giant dude that shows up and he's super awesome when he does show up. And I was just thinking how badass he looked in this film. Right. Um, what I thought I it was really cool, kind of like <clears throat> you have – uh, Eric, who kind of has that classic hair metal 80s mm -hmm. uh, look, and then you've got the Dark God, who's kind of like, you know, that that sort of aesthetic was big in the 60s, and then also in the 90s, uh, and then into the 2000s, so it's almost like uh, he's bookending Eric's you know, aesthetic, hair metal aesthetic. And I thought, to me, that was, uh, that was fun. And there's so much, uh, you know, of that, of that comparison throughout the movie, like um, the scene, the sex scene where Eric and Laurel are having sex. And it's, you know, it's very, it's almost romantic. And they're, they're, you know, it's, it's normal. It's, a little bit of uh, flesh here and there, but then you, the camera starts panning down to this macabre mirroring of the sex scene. Um, and you have, it's almost jarring how different they are, especially with all the blood and way more nudity and a lot more touching. Uh, <laughs> and then of course the, the soundtrack, like you have this gritty soundtrack throughout the entire, you know, synthy, um, a soundtrack throughout the entire movie and then during that scene uh that song new religion plays which instantly became a new favorite song of mine and <laughs> i loved it so much <laughs> i love that song too it's it's so great and that scene yeah that's definitely one of the standout scenes to the film you know that juxtaposition between the two different couples making love and uh i mean yeah it's just so great i remember charles was telling me about you know how they 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 kept getting stuck with the blood, you know, him and Judy, uh, <laughs> who uh, originally originally I don't know if we I think we gave Judy her her real name in the in the movie the actress who played Mrs. Madley, but her, her pseudo name I want to share her pseudo name in the original cut of the movie. So that is one of the changes we did. We put a real name in there. She she wanted it in there, but she originally had a pseudo name which was Juju Slowcomb, which is <laughs> very funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you do slow come <laughs> you know what i really like about that actor or, or about uh laurel is uh is like you said earlier the whole movie kind of has this like feel of being in a dreamland and so towards the end where there where she comes across uh Mr. and Mrs. Madley. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't too thrilled with the with the scene where she kills Mrs. Madley. You know, I thought maybe the angle could have been different. <laughs> but um, throughout that scene, she she is like killing them to you know for self defense. But then instead of running out of the house, she's just kind of like swaying through the house so you get a really good glimpse of all the blood on her silk robe uh but you also get the sense of like she also doesn't know like did that just happen did it not just happen i don't know what's going on is this still a dream um, am i just tired you know and she's just swaying through the house uh, and i thought that was one of like the better moments uh of her acting in that movie 
<laughs> yeah, her acting probably leaves a little bit to be desired. <laughs> but I think the story's so strong in it that it kind of goes past the performances. Because at least, like you know, all the details in the in the in the story itself is there, and that's what fascinates me about the film. Is it seems like this very rich story and world that it seems like it was very well conceived beforehand, and then they gave us a little tiny piece of that world that they built. Um, did you ever get any like stories or anything from? the makers about what their idea was for this, like their influences, their, um, how they built these characters. Cause it seems like there's a lot that got put into the script itself, the story itself. Oh, here's a question. Did you actually get a look at the script or was there that even a thing still? No, unfortunately uh, I haven't seen the script. Um, you know, I've had quite a few conversations with, uh, David Williams about the movie and, uh, you know, the, the main thing is, is, and I'll tell you this, it, it's, it's just David Williams in general. It's David Williams is an artist through and through. I mean, David Williams is a thinking filmmaker. He's a guy who likes to put lots of subtext. He likes to, you know, for example, one of his uh, latest films that he's working on, we were talking about. And he, he, he was telling me how he barely scripts his movie. This really? particular new movie. And that his thing is he hires actors who he believes can really pull off what he wants. And he believes in letting the actors improv, but he creates the situations. He creates, oh. you know, the situations to throw them into. And, you know, if you got a good enough actor, they're going to really roll with that well and bring their own piece to it as well, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and I, I, I've, I've been holding my tongue on this, but I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, mention it, uh, that he is, uh, there is talks of a Metal Noir reboot happening. Whoa. Um, I, I really hope it happens. Uh, I'm hoping I can be involved in any way I, that I can. I mean, David's in New York and I'm in California, so we're on different ends of, of the nation here in a pandemic. But uh, I really do hope that, that Metal Noir reboot or part two, whatever it can be, can happen. We've, we've talked some ideas about it. There's some really cool ideas and uh, I'm really excited. So I, I, really, hope, uh, I really hope we get the, the Metal Noir reboot. That's an exclusive here on Mariana. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna go sacrifice some people now so that I can make sure yeah. that it happens. <laughs> sacrifices for the dark god. David <laughs> is the dark god. Well, maybe maybe Bill will come back. Yeah, I'm sure Bill back. will will definitely be involved. I, I know Bill and David are working on a project right now together. So. That's really cool. I'm so excited now. <laughs> I can barely contain myself. <laughs> and their new project looks really cool as well. I, I urge people to, to definitely uh, follow uh, David's uh, company on Facebook, uh, Red Scream Studios. Uh, he does lots of interesting stuff, and he's been posting some pictures and updates of some of his projects recently. So uh, definitely check that out. Yeah, I'll put a link down below. That's Red Scream? Red, Red uh, Scream Films. Okay, cool. I'll put a link down below. Um, that that was exciting news. So now I forget what I was. Going to say. <laughs> I know you like threw us off. We weren't expecting that at all. <laughs> yeah. I know I wanted to t to mention it, but uh, you know I, I couldn't hold my tongue any longer. I was going to drop that bomb somewhere. <laughs> oh, I did. I did have another question um, before we kind of just keep going in and out. I mean, we don't really have a structure at the moment, but. Um, <laughs> What was the, did you ever hear why the film wasn't released? Um, was there a, what's the story behind that? Because it's such a good film. And it, I mean, I'm so glad it's released now and it's out there in the world. And it seems almost kismet that, that you found it. And now it's out there for people to enjoy, especially like metal fans, horror fans, every film fans, and they get enjoy it. But what was the original reason that it wasn't released? So, um... It's, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, most of the people I talked to didn't really remember too much why it never came out. Um, really? Okay. The way, what I found out, though, I, was, I did some research, you know, I was digging through old Draculina magazines, uh, which was Hugh Gallagher's publication. Amazing magazine if you're into independent horror from the 80s and 90s. I highly recommend it. Um, anyway, so I uh, was looking through there and there was a few articles about Metal Noir. And uh, one of them said it was picked up by a distributor. So at one time it was picked up by a distributor, but then that distributor promptly went out of business. So 
they never released the film. And uh, I know David R. Williams went on to working on other projects. And so it was just one of those things that kind of just fell by the wayside, you know, and, you know, you guys are filmmakers, you know how it is. Like you work on a project, you kind of finish it. It, it kind of does what it does. And then you move on to your next one because you always want to create. You know, so I'm pretty sure that's kind of what happened with Metal Nor. I mean, he was pretty shocked when I, you know, reached out to him initially and was like, hey, I love your movie. You know? <laughs> I think he was like, wow, you know, probably didn't anticipate hearing anyone wanting to even talk about this movie, you know, 20, 30 years later, you know. Oh, yeah. I think this. Now here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want more of that world. I mean, if somebody's writing like even fan fiction or something, I'd probably go and read that. You know, just yeah. to explore it and be in there. I like the characters. Uh, Mariana, do you have uh, what else? What else is in your your brain? I um, I really like the props, <laughs> like I said before. But the um, the metal. I have a question about the metal ring with the spikes. Where is that now? You know, I, as far as I know, uh, he no longer has the ring. Um, no. Which How is, are we going to make part two? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm guessing they'll make a new one or get a new one. I, I really hope that the metal ring's got to come back, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's such a... I mean, and, and for people who haven't seen the movie, you know, uh, you can check out the trailer. Uh, we, we got that on our YouTube. But the movie opens with this amazing scene, and it's Charles Pinion holding the metal ring, bashing himself in the skull with it. I mean, it's... And, and it's shot in shadow, you know, it's metal, it's nor, it's the whole thing. It actually, you know, I love movies that actually kind of have their title in the film and it's right in the first couple minutes there. And it's such a strong and powerful scene. I mean, oh, yeah. Charles acting, he, he just sells that so great. And, uh, you know, a lesser actor would not have sold that at all. And uh, that, that, that ring, yeah, it's, it's so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> I'd love to have one of those for my collection. Yeah. <laughs> It looks brutal, like just by the, he holds it up. And I mean, I guess there's a lot of symbolism and everything right there, kind of a, a crown of thorns, but of metal and everything like that. But when he holds it up, it just looks absolutely brutal. Like you don't even want to go near it because you're afraid of your eyes. And then he starts doing that. And then uh, well, yeah. David was saying in the commentary, like this was, this wasn't created. This was something they found and it was actually very sharp. And everyone on set was very like scared when he would when when Charles was was bashing you know bashing himself in the face with it because they were afraid he was actually gonna hurt himself, and that's why I'm like so so interested in where this relic has gone because it can only have gone two places either the ether or someone's collection you know. <laughs> you know like now that I know that it was just found that's kind of creepier and like kind yeah of like what was it created for what is it nobody knows <laughs> it's a fetish store if I'm correct some kind of SNL oh. fetish yeah. type store if I remember right nice <laughs> <laughs> oh man this was such a good movie I'm gonna go watch it again soon <laughs> You know, it's funny, I've, I, you know, re-editing the movie from scratch, it's like, you know, in a sense, I've, I've seen this movie probably, I don't know, 50, 60 times. And when you do a DVD company, you have to QC the movie multiple times. And, you know, I, at this point, I've probably seen the movie a hundred times. And, and I agree, it never gets boring for me. I, I absolutely love it. You know, honestly, after this conversation, I might just have to go on and throw it on again. because yeah. <laughs> It's just such a fun movie. Yeah, once or twice I've put it on thinking, okay, I'm just going to have it on while I like do this other thing or while I'm getting ready or something. And I always just end up, there's certain scenes in there that I'm just like, stop and have to watch it for a while. <laughs> there's great visuals, you know, there's just so many, yeah, it's like every five or six minutes, it kind of follows almost that Roger Corman rule of having every seven minutes having some type of action going on, you know, to draw the viewer in. Oh, yeah. it never lets down, and in even the moments where she, where it's just kind of a dialogue thing, sort of going, you, I think you get into that because you're you're listening more because there is a lot of dialogue and a lot of detail to it. So I'm always paying extra attention because of the story that's there, and I want to learn more about it. So I'm kind of like looking past those performances, and just like almost like you're reading a book at the same time, or rather like watching a graphic novel because of all the imagery and and things that are popping up uh, throughout the film. 
You know, I do have one one scene that that kind of rubs me wrong, and maybe you guys can shed some light onto why, because I don't know why it rubs me wrong so much, but um, it's a scene where Laurel and Eric are in the kitchen, and they they're arguing because Laurel wants to scrap her entire book, and that dialogue goes on so long <laughs> and at the end you know you don't really see what happens with the book so that scene almost seemed unnecessary except to show that they that they still have this like they they fight but they still have this like bond with each other that you know he's there to support her uh and vice versa but it is I interesting that it's yeah that 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 they fight over you know him loving her art so much. I mean, that is kind of an interesting thing to see a couple fight about. Normally it would be, you know, I don't know, we're upset about something we don't agree on, where in this case it's like, no, I love your art. I mean, and he's so over the top in that scene. Honestly, uh, I, I find his performance in that scene to be pretty hilarious, yeah. you know. You can't scrap. I, I did laugh. <laughs> I've never written. You've ever written, you know. Head like that. Even the love scene, you know. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's it, it's the performance is very over the top uh, by him in that in that particular scene, which makes it really fun as well. But I think, yeah, I think it's interesting that kind of subtext of their fight is about him, you know, caring more about her art than she kind of does, you know. And I do mm -hmm. kind of wonder, you know. I, 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 it makes me wonder sometimes, you know, yeah, what, what David was exactly thinking with, with, uh, with that, you know, chunk of dialogue there. Well, I think it's, it is, I do find it that it is important. I feel like if it's, if it was done differently where like he was yelling at her because she wasn't done with her book and that like, how are you even making income if you're not, if you're not writing, you know, <clears throat> that would have given it a whole different feel. But I think that, you know, now that I that I've said it out loud, I think that it was important because at the end, you know, when he gets, um, I guess, possessed or becomes a slave of the dark god, he um, at first he just want like with his guts out wants to make love to her because that's what the what the dark god is about. It's about you know flesh and metal and blood, um, but you know, instead of like madly sacrificing his wife, he actually goes out of his way to save Laurel in the end. And I think that maybe that scene was set up to show that they had this love that was so great that he was able to break that spell and um, go against the dark God. For sure, that's a great point, for sure, yeah. There's, um. It, it feels like there was supposed to be like even more to this story almost like did you ever like talk to the director and did he ever like mention that there, I mean you, you, there is supposed to be a possible sequel reboot coming up and is because they talk about a dark trilogy but I think they meant like trinity but if they were talking about trilogy it seems like there'd be other they do mention other gods and this is just one of the gods that came down to you know what he says at the beginning this god reached out uh, out of the many other gods that he was trying to reach out to, so um, I don't know. As as a fan, like I'm, I'm excited to. I'm knowing now with that little bit of uh, news to kind of find out were there other gods or is. Uh, I want a prequel with Charles Pinion. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, if we get a prequel with the uh, the fan of the, oh, because at the beginning it says that when she's uh, talking about uh, what happened in the house and he goes, he cut her up and then sewed her back together and then he killed himself. And it's like, I want to see somebody get cut up and then sewn back together. I want to see what happened in that whole sequence. We do at least get to see the scene <clears throat> like from the beginning where he's stabbing himself in the face. We kind of see like that, the context that it's in later in the movie where he's got his wife right under him <laughs> which i by the way that was like a weirdest position for someone to be murdering someone else but it was so good the over top the top performances uh, in several scenes have definitely made helped in making this movie like climb up my favorites ladder but that scene in particular and he's in a speedo that <laughs> is hilarious and he's just like going at it just like ah. 
Charles is so great in it. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, I, I don't know if the movie would have uh, been as great with another actor in that part. I mean, he, he just, you could tell he was so dedicated to it. And uh, I mean, one of, one of the funny stories about it is, you know, he wasn't that old at the time. I think he was in his early 20s and he actually shaved, you know, he shaved a widow's peak in his hair oh. so he could try to look a little older. I mean, how, how many actors are gonna do that, especially for, you know, a no budget shot on video movie? I mean, I, I don't think they really got, you know, made any money for making this film. I think it was more just, hey, you know, let's get together and make this, this movie, you know? Because I think at that time, Charles had only done Twisted Issues, if I'm right, which is another great movie. I, if you guys haven't seen Twisted Issues, I, I highly recommend that one. I believe he sells those himself, so you could contact him online to, to pick up a copy of that one. I'm going to do that awesome. now. <laughs> oh, Charles' uh, stuff is great, too. Yeah, if you like Metal Noir, Charles, uh, another uh, great uh, artistic SOV filmmaker. It's a lot more than just blood and gore with his stuff, you know. Uh, definitely a lot more going on in those movies. Um, let's see what else. Uh, so, oh, I did have a quick question. Uh, do you know how, how long did it take them to film this movie? You know, I, I do recall reading that and, and off the top of my head, I don't remember. I think it was pretty fast though. I think they shot it in about a week or so, if I remember correctly. Uh, Hugh Gallagher, uh, it, there was an issue of Draculina that actually Hugh goes into, uh, the entire making of the movie, which is really interesting. Uh, if I remember correctly, Draculina number 16, 16 okay. or 19. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I believe it was a short shoot. I don't, I don't think they, you know, went very long. In the audio commentary, David also mentioned that um, that it was, uh, I can't remember what month, but it was cold already outside. But even the, even if it had been cold, if it hadn't been cold outside, that basement was always cold. And wasn't it like a house that he lived in at the time or something? Something like that. I believe maybe so. I, I know the, the trailer <laughs> in the movie was uh, in his family. I believe that was his, his father's trailer. I, I know he wishes he still had that, actually. But, uh, yeah, I know that was in the family for sure. Yeah. Oh. This okay. is such a good conversation. <laughs> I'm really glad you joined us. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, um, you know, uh, David uh, would probably be uh, happy to talk to you guys as well. So really, feel yeah, feel free to reach out oh. to David. He's such, a, and if you guys get him, please, I'd love to come on and uh, yes, <laughs> that would be a great we'll do a reunion <laughs> video. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've never had a, a physical conversation with David, so we've oh. only conversed over email and stuff like that. So uh, I, I'd I'd love to actually speak to him, you know, mano a mano, so to speak. Let's do it. Let's bring these lovebirds together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll just, um, we'll keep that. That was a good conversation. We'll keep that to uh, this episode. And then we'll look forward to talking to David R. Williams. If we can get a hold of him and all that, I mean, that would be a wonderful uh, episode conversation. So, and, and I think we did a really good job of talking about this film without actually giving spoilers, but also be able to like talk about things that we like. So, um, so I'm going to say it again, go over to SOV Horror and buy your own copy of Metal Noir um, right there. I got mine. So just go and pick yours up and it's super good. I really enjoy it. And the sun is getting crazy in my eyes right now. <laughs> um, say something uh, delightful in Spanish for everybody to send them off today. Uh, why do you... Do this to me. <laughs> um, the call of the dark metal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would just be dark metal in, in Spanish because that's that's what happens in other languages. They just take English words for colloquial <laughs> things. <laughs> so it would be just like, me gusta dark metal. <laughs> there you go. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll get it. Uh, uh, Tony, is there anything else that you wanted to plug while you're here? I know you got a, a lot of sh movies and stuff that are, you're coming out with SOV Horror that people can order and stuff. Sure, yeah. So uh, just uh, last Friday, we put out Mr. Ice Cream Man, uh, 1995 shot on video horror film. Uh, not to be confused with the Clint Howard movie. It was actually produced before that film. 
And uh, we just released that last Friday. Uh, so really excited about that release. That was another one, seven months in the making, one of the longest, uh, you know, uh, in-house productions that we were working on. Um, and then next month, uh, we're releasing two uh, new movies on August 13th. We're putting out two by Chris LaMartina, who people probably know from uh, WNUF Halloween special, as well as Call Girl of Cthulhu. And we're putting out his first two movies, uh, AmeriKill, which is a slasher he made when he was like 14 years old. It's great. It's pretty much if 14 year olds made Scream. And, uh, and then uh, uh, an anthology he made right after that, uh, not too long after that, called Dead Teenagers, which is kind of his ode to creep show. So it's very stylized kind of a horror anthology. So yeah, we got both of those coming out on the 13th and uh, a ton of more releases. I mean, every month up until the end of the year, we're putting out two movies a month. So uh, awesome. definitely look, uh, look me up on Facebook, Tony Massiello. Follow me if you want all the updates. Uh, we also have the SOV Horror page on Facebook. Um, not updated as much, but I do put stuff on there as well. So, yeah. Well, I'll put all the links down below so everybody can go click on that and everything. Um, this has been a great episode. Thanks for joining us again, Tony. Appreciate it. Anytime. And uh, we'll have you next time with David. Please, we'll try please. that. We'll try our darndest. Um, all right, yeah, and then everybody that's watching this also, uh, by the time that you see this, Specimen 6 will be on Vimeo to uh, rent. Uh, it'll be very cheap. Uh, and so please go there if you want to watch a crazy-ass bloody slasher film that I made and Mariana is in it. And uh, you get a, she's not, I don't want to give anything away. Just go and watch Specimen 6 if you love slasher films and horror films and a little bit of nudity here and there. All right, everybody. Well, you take care of yourself, and we'll catch you later. Thank you again, Tony, Mariana. Bye, everybody.